Income tax 2022-2023 education credits overview. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from instructions for Form 8863 Education Credits, American Opportunity, and Lifetime Learning Credits Tax Year 2022. You can find on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it tax formula we're at the bottom here looking at the credits area remember in the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement although a strange one the bottom line being the taxable income similar to net income the bottom line of a normal income statement we then calculate the tax on the taxable income not with one rate not with a flat tax but instead with a progressive tax system to get to the tax before credits and other taxes then we're finally getting to that credit area as well as other taxes which could be like self-employment tax for example and then we have to deal with the payments which will be the format of withholdings or estimated tax payments to get to the bottom line tax refund or tax due remember credits are like deductions in that we like them both but if we can get a dollar credit or a dollar deduction, we would have rather have usually the dollar credit because usually we would get the full dollar benefit as opposed to a dollar deduction, which would simply be decreasing by a dollar taxable income. The benefit would be dependent on our tax rate. Also, Remember that the credits down here are broken out into the non-refundable and refundable credits. The non-refundable credits do not take the tax liability below zero. The refundable credits do, making the refundable credits using the tax code more like a welfare or benefit program as opposed to a tax system once you go past that point to the refundable part. Okay, reminders about the education credits. Limits on modified adjusted gross income, the MAGI. Remember that as we look at these credits, uh, the income, as income goes up, sometimes the credits will phase out. We don't base that on the gross income, but rather the AGI, the adjusted gross income. The M just means that we're going to take that AGI and modify it for certain things related to this particular credit. So it's pretty much like the AGI slightly adjusted in essence. So the lifetime learning credit and the American Opportunity Credit MAGI modified adjusted gross income limits are 180,000 if you're married filing jointly, 90,000 if you're filing single head of household or qualifying surviving spouse. See table 1 and the instructions for line 3 or line 14. Then you've got the form 1098T requirement. That's the form that the financial inst I mean the educational institution, the financial department of the, of the educational institution will typically give you reflecting the payments usually being uh, the tuition. So to be eligible to claim the American Opportunity Credit or Lifetime Learning Credit, the law requires taxpayers or a dependent, depending on who had the education, to have received Form 1098T tuition statement from an eligible educational institution, whether domestic or foreign. That's kind of similar to like a W-2, for example. The institution's going to be providing this to you. The government also is making them provide it to them so that they are basically looking over your shoulder. That's why it's kind of a requirement because they can basically double check that. However, you may claim one of these education benefits if the student doesn't receive a Form 1098-T because the student's educational institution isn't required to furnish a Form 1098-T to the student under existing rules. For example, if the student is a qualified non-resident alien, has certain qualified education expenses paid entirely with scholarships, has certain qualified education expenses paid under a formal billing arrangement, or is un enrolled only in courses for which no academic credit 
is awarded. All right, so if a student's educational institution isn't required to provide a form 1098-2T to the student, so you may claim one of these education benefits without a form 1098-T if you otherwise qualify, can demonstrate that you or a dependent were enrolled at an eligible educational institution and can substantiate the payment of qualified tuition and related expenses. So the bottom line is you will normally get a 1098-T from the institution. If you don't, you wanna check with them to get the 1098-T because they're usually gonna send one to the IRS as well. If you're in an unusual situation, then you might have some unusual situations where they don't send out the 1098-T, in which case you could go to verify and see if you could still claim at that point. So you may also claim one of these educational benefits if the student attended an eligible educational institution required to furnish form 1098-T, but the student doesn't receive form 1098-T before you file the tax return. For example, if the institution is otherwise required to furnish the form 1098-T and doesn't furnish it or refuses to do so, and you take the required following steps, after January 31st, 2023, or before you file the return, uh, you, are, uh, you or the student must request that the educational institution furnish a form 1098-T. So obviously, it's kind of similar to a 1099. If, if the person that issues it doesn't issue it or gets it wrong, then you've got to go to them and see if they can issue it, pressure them to issue the form properly because again the irs is going to get it on their side as well and they want to basically be able to double check things on their side uh, you must fully cooperate with the educational institution's efforts to gather the information needed to furnish the form 1098t so if the financial institution says i can't do it because you won't give me your address or email or whatever for me to send it to you well then that's kind of your fault you have to be you have to give them the information oh splendid just give your information to mrs penny apple and necessary for them to process the form 1098t you must also otherwise qualify for the benefit be able to demonstrate that you or a dependent were enrolled at an eligible educational institution and substantiate the payment of qualified tuition and related expenses the amount of qualified tuition and related expenses reported on Form 1098-T may not reflect the total amount of the qualified tuition and related expenses paid during the year for which you may claim an education tax benefit. So note, the amount on the 1098-T, you would think the reason the IRS basically requires it is because that will require the baseline amount that you were indeed enrolled in, a, in an educational institution. However, that uh, 1098-T you would think would generally be reporting the expenses that are related to the tuition. You might have other more expansive expenses that you can basically possibly deduct uh, that aren't on the 1098-T maybe, but the IRS still wants that 1098-T to be a requirement to qualify at all because that's going to give some give them an idea that you were at least enrolled in the financial institutions. In other words, if you're claiming books or something like that uh, that you had to purchase or for the financial for the school, then they would like to at least prove that you paid tuition to the school, and therefore it would make sense that you're buying books for school. If you, if they can't confirm that, then it'd be hard for them to confirm anything. Okay, so you may reflect the total amount. So we looked at that. You may include qualified tuition and related expenses that are not reported on Form 1098-T when claiming one of the related credits. If you can substantiate payment of these expenses, you may not include expenses paid on the Form 1098-T that have been paid by qualified scholarship, including those that were not processed by the university. So then the amounts that on, are on the 1098-T, you could have some issues with them, when we get into like the scholarship where they paid uh, by a scholarship, not by you. In that case, they weren't really an expense to you and you would think you wouldn't get a credit related to them in that case because because they were paid by scholarship. So caution to claim the American Opportunity Credit, you must provide the additional institutions, the educational institutions, employer identification number EIN on form 8863. You should be able to get that 
from the institution, you should be able to get this information from Form 1098T or Form 1098T when you populate that or the educational institution. Ban on claiming the American Opportunity Credit. If you claim the American Opportunity Credit, even though you're not eligible, you may be banned from claiming the credit depending on your conduct. So see the caution statement under American Opportunity Credit later. So these credits are the types of things that like scammers and people that are trying to uh, commit fraud or something like that on the taxes are likely to try to to take advantage of. And so the IRS is going to put restrictions on uh, possibly or ban if they feel that you've tried to, to abuse the American Opportunity Credit. So taxpayers identification number, the TIN needed by due date of return. So if you haven't been issued a TIN by the due date of your 2022 return, including extensions, you can't claim the American Opportunity Credit on either your original or amended 2022 return. Also, the American Opportunity Credit isn't allowed on either your original or amended 2022 return for a student who hasn't been issued a TIN by the due date of your 2022 return, including extension. Hey, no extension cards. Then we've got the form 8862 may be required. If your American Opportunity Credit has was denied or reduced for any reason other than a math or clerical error for any tax year beginning after 2015 you must attach a completed form 8862 information to claim certain credits after disallowance so that would be hopefully an unusual situation uh, to your tax return for the next tax year for which you claim the credit see form 8862 and its instructions for details purpose of form Use Form 8862 to figure and claim your education credits, which are based on adjusted qualified education expenses paid to an eligible educational institution post-secondary. That's the general concept, post-secondary institution. For 2022, there are two education credits. So here's where it gets a little bit confusing because now we've got these payments to education benefits. Remember, the general rule of an income tax is that we would get to deduct you would think those things that we needed to help generate revenue but then the tax code has all these other things that they put in place to try to incentivize people in the form of either deductions or credits and both education being one of those and you can imagine you know multiple different laws where they kind of overlap on could, could you take these expenses as a deduction could you take them as a credit and now we have these two credits that kind of came came about as time has passed and we kind of think of them together now because one credit is typically better than the other if you qualify it although more stringent to qualify for so the credits are then the american opportunity credit part of which uh you may may be refundable meaning it takes the tax liability basically below zero uh and then you've got the lifetime learning credit which is non-refundable so in almost every way, if you qualify for the American Opportunity Credit, it will be better off. It's usually a bigger dollar amount, and you may have a refundable portion if you need it, taking the tax liability below zero, still resulting in a benefit or re refund, even if you don't owe any tax past that point. Whereas the Lifetime Learning Credit is usually a lesser dollar amount and non-refundable. It's not going to take your, your tax liability below zero. So when thinking about qualifying for these credits, we usually think of them kind of together now. You know, you're going to try for the American Opportunity Credit and then if you, and then default to the Lifetime Learning Credit is the general idea. Okay, a refundable credit can give you a refund when the credit is more than the tax you owe, even if you aren't required to file a tax return. A non-refundable credit can reduce your, your tax, but any excess isn't refunded to you. Both of these credits have different rules that can affect your eligibility to claim a specific credit. These differences are shown on table one. So here's basically a list. Let's go through a quick kind of rundown of these two credits. Remember the general idea though being that you're going to think first if you could take the American Opportunity Credit and then Lifetime Learning. We'll go through each of them in detail, but but when you're imagining them in your mind, that's your that's your thought process. You're going to try to see if I can get one, then the other usually. All right, so the maximum credit for the American Opportunity Credit up to 2,500 credit 
per eligible student, whereas the lifetime learning credit up to $2,000 credit per return. Big difference per student per return. So the next one, limit on modified adjusted gross income or the MAGI, the phase out of your income level phase out, 180,000 for the American Opportunity Credit if married filing joint, 90,000 if single head of household or qualifying surviving spouse, whereas the lifetime learning credit, also 180,000 if married filing joint, 90,000 if single head of household, so same items there refundable or non-refundable american opportunity credit 40 percent of the credit may be refundable taking the liability even below zero resulting in a benefit resulting in a refund even if you don't owe any tax past that point the rest is non-refundable so only 40 percent whereas the lifetime learning non-refundable credit is limit to the amount of tax you must pay on your taxable income next one we have the number of years of post-secondary education so the american opportunity credit available only if the student had not completed the first four years of post-secondary education for 2022 so we're limited there whereas the lifetime learning available for all years of post-secondary education and for a course uh, to acquire or improve skills so much more expansive on the lifetime learning there which means you might cap out on what you can take in terms of the number of years american opportunity but you could keep on possibly taking the lifetime learning after that point number of tax return credit available so american opportunity credit available uh only for four tax years per eligible student so you only have the four years that you could take that because that's the general time frame of post-secondary college in essence and then on the lifetime learning available for an unlimited number of tax years then you've got the type of program required american opportunity credit student must be pursuing a program leading to a degree or other recognized education credential whereas the lifetime learning credit student doesn't need to be pursuing a program leading to a degree or other recognized education credential and next one number of courses american opportunity credit student must be enrolled in at, at least half time for at least one academic period beginning during 2022 or the first three months of 2023 if the qualified expenses were paid in 2022 you've got a bit of that timing difference we'll talk about in more detail later but that's the general idea lifetime learning available for one or more courses so much less restriction on the lifetime learning than the number of courses that you would need to take for the american opportunity credit a uh, felony drug convention conviction as of the end of 2022 the student had not been convicted of a felony uh for possessing a distributing controlled substances so they kind of threw this one in there has nothing to do really with education and whatnot but you know they threw that in there whereas the lifetime learning felony drug convictions uh, don't make the student ineligible qualified expenses tuition required enrollment fees and course materials this is the lifetime learning side that the student needs for a course of study whether or not the materials are bought at the educational institution as a condition of enrollment or attendance whereas the lifetime uh the lifetime learning credit tuition and required enrollment fees including amounts required to be paid to the institution for course related books uh supplies and equipment so this one's more broad on the american opportunity credit side of things because these are the amount of expenses which means the possible deduction is more likely to be higher because you're, you you have more things that might be included as qualified expenses a little bit more restricted a lot more restricted on the lifetime learning credits then we've got payments for academic periods uh the american opportunity credit payments made in 2022 for academic periods beginning this is both of them into in 2022 or beginning in the first three months of 2023 so you've got this timing thing because you might prepay you might say hey look i paid for it in 2022 but the classes don't start until 2023 well for usually we're on a cash basis for taxes so usually that that's going to be okay but the irs doesn't want you to take advantage of that by coming up to an agreement with the school that you're going to pay like five years in advance to take a bigger credit this year or something like that so 
Uh, so you have this limitation on that kind of cutoff rule. And then we've got the TIN needed by filing due date, American Opportunity Credit. Filers and students must have been issued a TIN by the due date of their 2022 return. Lifetime Learning Credit. Students must have been issued a TIN by the due date of their 2022 return. And then the Educational Institutions EIN, American Opportunity Credit. You must provide the educational institution's employer identification number. That, that's usually going to be given to you uh, in, in the form, but that's the EIN. It's going to be put on form 8863, usually not a problem. And lifetime learning credit, educational institution's employer identification number is not required on form 8863. All right, who can claim an education credit? You may be able to claim an education credit if you, your spouse, or a dependent you claim on your tax return was a student enrolled at or attending an eligible educational institution. So you're talking about, obviously, if it's yourself, then you paid for the, for the educational expenses. If it's someone that is a dependent, that's when it gets a little bit more confusing, but you would think that if you were claiming them on your tax return, and you paid for their education expenses, then they would be included too. So once again, you may be able to claim an education credit if you, your spouse, or a dependent you claim on your tax return was a student enrolled at or attended an, edu an eligible educational institution. For 2022, the credits are based on the amount of adjusted qualified education expenses paid for the student in 2022 for academic periods beginning in 2022 or beginning in the first three months of 2023. Academic. I'm an academic. Period. An academic period is any quarter, semester, trimester, or any other period of study as reasonably determined by an eligible educational institution. If an eligible educational institution uses credit hours or clock hours and doesn't have academic terms, each payment period may be treated as an academic period. For details, see academic period in chapter two and three of publication 970. So the academic periods are standardized to some degree, but different institutions have different, uh, different periods, but usually quarter, semester, trimester are what you will see. Who can claim a dependent's expenses? If a student is claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return, all qualified education expenses of the student are treated as having been paid by that person. Therefore, only that person can claim an education credit for the student. So once again, if a student is claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return, all required education expenses of the student are treated and having been paid by that person. Therefore, only that person can claim an education credit for the student. If a student isn't claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return, only the student can claim uh, the credit, which kind of, so it kind of, of course, kind of makes sense here. Obviously, if the student is a dependent of someone else, you would think then part of being a dependent would be that they're they're paying over half of the of of the expenses and so on so you would think whoever's claiming them as a dependent would be the one likely being able to take the credit whereas if the student isn't being claimed as a dependent then they would be able to claim themselves or take uh, the credit in that case so expenses paid by a third party Qualified education expenses paid on behalf of the student by someone other than the student, such as a relative, are treated as paid by the student, which makes sense because if it wasn't that way, let's say you had you know, a rich uncle or something like that paid for the tuition uh, for a student, then who would get the credit? The uncle couldn't because they're not claiming the student as a deduction. And, and that would be a mess, right? So the, the, that would mean th they would have to give the money either to the, to the parents who are claiming them as a dependent or the students themselves. And then the student would have to pay for the expenses, but the uncle might want them to, as a condition to spend the money on school or something like that. So it would, so it would kind of make sense that someone would get the credit and whoever's claiming the student, whether it be the student themselves or the parents, for example, and not the third party, you would think would still be able to get a benefit of the credit. Okay, so once again, qualified education expenses paid on behalf 
of the student by someone other than the student, such as a relative, are treated as paid by the student. However, qualified education expenses paid or treated as paid by student who is claimed as a dependent on your tax return are treated as paid by you. So if the, if the student paid for the tuition and the student was, was uh, a dependent of someone, you would basically, it wouldn't be right, you would think to say, well, now the student can't claim the deduction because they're a dependent, but they're the one that paid the tuition, and now the parent doesn't get that, even though as a dependent, they, you would think that they are still providing the financial support of the student. So again, it's just kind of a logistical thing in terms of who actually paid the the uh, tuition. You would think someone would get the benefit and you would think the person who gets the benefit is the person who's claiming the student as a dependent or the student themselves if they're not being claimed as a dependent anywhere else. Therefore, you're treated as having paid expenses that were paid by the third party. For more information and an example, see who can claim a dependent's expenses in Publication 970, Chapter 2 and 3. We'll take a look at that more later, most likely. Who cannot claim a credit? You cannot claim an education credit on a 2022 tax return if any of the following apply. One, you're claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return, such as your parents' return. So if you're claimed as a as a dependent on someone else's tax return, then you would think that there are the ones that might be able to get the benefit of the credit. Two, your filing status is married filing uh, separately. So we've got the same kind of thing. If you're married, you can't go back to single. You got to file married filing joint or married filing separately. The IRS is skeptical of people married filing separately, taking advantage of the credit, especially with the AGI limitations and the phase outs. So oftentimes you lose some of the credits that you may otherwise get by filing married filing separately. Therefore, it would be more beneficial generally to file married filing joint if you're subject to these kind of credits. So three, uh, you or your spouse were a non-resident alien for any part of 2022 and didn't elect to be treated as a resident alien for tax purposes. Four, your MAGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income, your income level is $180,000 or more if married filing jointly or $90,000 or more if single, head of household or qualifying surviving spouse with dependent child. Five, the student has not been issued a TIN by the due date of their 2022 return, including extensions. Generally, your MHI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income, is the amount on your Form 1040 or 1040SR Line 11, your AGI. However, if you're filing Form 2555, this is where the modification comes in, the M, uh, Foreign Earned Income, or Form 4563, Exclusion of Income for bona fide Residents of America, Samoa, or are excluding income from Puerto Rico, add to the amount on your Form 1040 or 1040SR Line 11, the amount of income you excluded. For details there, if you have to dive into that in more detail, look at Publication 970. Tax software hopefully can help out with those situations as well.